The Mystery of Gravitation appeared in the Earth Review magazine, April 1893. In the National Review for January 1892, there is an article by J. E. Gore with the above title. The writer commences by saying, quote, The law of gravitation discovered by Sir Isaac Newton is believed by astronomers to rule with absolute sway throughout the length and breadth of the visible universe. Gravity acts in proportion to the mass and inversely as the square of the distance. This is the law of its action. But the inquiring mind is tempted to ask, how does it act? What is the mysterious mechanism which produces gravitative action between two distant bodies unconnected by any material bond? We cannot from experience gain any explanation of action at a distance. After this confession, Mr. Gore proceeds to give or quote a number of hypotheses or scientific guesses as to how bodies can act at a distance while unconnected by any material bond. He does not go to the root of the matter and question the existence of this mysterious something called gravitation. He only proceeds to inquire how it may possibly act upon the most distant planet, comets, meteors, and revolving double stars. Now, sir, would it not be more scientific first to prove the existence of such a force, before proceeding to inquire how it acts? I think so. But as the writer speaks of, quote, Newton's discovery of universal gravitation, he perhaps thought this inquiry was unnecessary. But before inquiring, for instance, how the sun manages to pull at the moon, or how the moon pulls at the earth, without any connecting rope or chain, I should like to know how and when Newton discovered that such action does take place at all. Can any reader enlighten me on this point? As far as my reading goes, at present, it seems to me that Sir Isaac Newton invented the idea of universal gravitation rather than discovered such a force, and that he invented it because it was necessary to his mathematical device of a revolving and rotating earth and sea globe. This is a very important question. Was universal gravitation a real discovery, or was it a mere scientific idea and invention? I affirm it was the latter, and I deny that the idea of solar or stellar gravitation has any true basis in the facts of nature. I shall appeal to the article in question in support of my contention, which article was written by a Newtonian. First, I ask, why is there so much mystery surrounding this doctrine of gravitation? In his History of Physical Astronomy, Professor Grant says, quote, Whether gravitation is a quality inherent in and necessarily coexistent with matter, or whether it is a principle essentially distinct from it and operating merely on its constituent parts, is a question which, in all probability, is destined forever to prove irresolvable to the most penetrating inquiries of the human mind. That is, to put the question in plain words, does matter itself attract? Or is there something else distinct from matter which does all the pulling? The learned professor says that he does not know, and that in all probability no one ever will know. What is this but a veiled confession that the astronomers themselves know nothing at all about it? That it is all philosophical hypothesis or scientific guesswork? In a letter to Dr. Bentley, dated February 25, 1693, or about ten years after his supposed discovery, Newton makes the following confession, quote, That gravity should be innate, inherent, or essential in matter, so that one body may act upon another at a distance, through a vacuum, without the mediation of anything else, by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to the other, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws. But whether this agent be material or immaterial, I have left to the consideration of my readers. This is very kind of Newton, and very flattering to the penetration of his readers. He leaves it for them to decide. And now, they appeal to him. I agree with him, however, in saying that it is an absurdity to believe that bodies can act at a distance, and such distances 
and that they can pull one another about like the great globes of the universe are said to do, and this too without any chains or couplings. Yet at another time, Newton seems to fall into this very absurdity. Newton says, quote, have not the small particles of bodies certain powers, virtues, or forces, by which they act at a distance? What I call attraction may be performed by impulse, or by some other means unknown to me, on which the above-mentioned writer properly remarks, this passage clearly shows that even Newton's penetrating intellect was unable to frame a satisfactory theory of gravitative action. Then why, I ask, believe in such an absurd and occult property? Newton confesses the idea to be a, quote, absurdity, yet he is compelled to adopt the absurdity himself, or to confess that gravity acts by some means unknown to him. Another time, he supposes this secret force to be a universal repulsion, which of course is the very opposite of universal gravitation or attraction. But as Taylor remarks, quote, this ingenious scheme of universal repulsion leaves no room for that self-repulsion of matter exhibited in the phenomena of elasticity. And, as Mr. Gore reminds us, these phenomena have indeed proved insurmountable difficulties in all kinetic theories of gravitation. This confession is honest. Thus the best astronomers are all at sea respecting gravitation, and they are each propounding theories respecting it which are mutually contradictory and destructive. Yet this baseless idea of gravitation acting on all bodies and in all conceivable directions and distances, is a fundamental doctrine lying at the very basis of the teachings of modern astronomy. It is one of its main pillars, if not its chief support. Without solar gravitation, the globe would have flown off at a tangent into space, and would probably before now have collided with some other world than ours, and we should have been suffering or consigned to a worse fate than that which we were threatened last November, owing to a predicted collision between the Earth and a comet. See the Earth Review for January. However, as we have fortunately survived this catastrophe, I would modestly ask any of our learned scientists to try to explain for your readers how the sun can possibly pull at the Earth at the distance we are told of 92 or 93 millions of miles. What is the connecting rod or coupling between the two bodies? What chain exists between them? Of what are its links composed? And where is it attached? Is the force incessant? And if so, what keeps it up? Does the sun exhibit any loss of energy or force for such tremendous and constant dynamic expenditure? Does the force come out from the sun to the earth, or vice versa? And if so, why does it turn back suddenly on reaching that or any other body? These are practical questions. No locomotive that we know of can drag the railway carriages after it unless they are first carefully coupled onto it, and by some extraneous power. Why should the sun or moon be able to pull at the globe with all its weight of mountains, seas, and continents unconnected by any material bond? Such an action has never been known to take place on the earth. Then what reason is there for supposing it takes place in the sky? The idea is unreasonable contrary to universal experience, and as Newton was obliged to confess, philosophically absurd. It is so great an absurdity that he says, I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Now, sir, I believe the same, and I am delighted to be in harmony with so great an authority as Sir Isaac Newton on this point.